In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Heavenly King, Comforter, Spirit of Truth, who everywhere present and fill all things, Treasury of good things and giver of life, come and abide in us and cleanse us from every impurity and save our souls, O good one. Welcome to the Orthologio Orthodox Apologetics channel. This week we're going to be doing a second video on the teachings of Jesus Christ in the New Testament with an emphasis specifically on Mark chapter 12 verses 28 to 37. But before we get to there, we're going to look at the teachings of Jesus in the New Testament as a whole and see how the monotheism taught by Jesus is unique and differs from Islam. Okay, why I'm starting with this is because as we're going to see, Mark 12, 28 to 34 is a passage used by rabbinic Jews and Muslims to refute the polemic of Trinitarianism and say that Jesus taught Tawhid, Jesus taught strict universal monotheism, but as we're going to see in this video, that is not the case. So let's start. Our first question, our passage to explore in scripture is Colossians 1, 15 to 17. In the New King James Version, it reads, He is the image of the invisible God, the first born over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. So our Lord Jesus Christ did not teach monotheism the same way Muhammad did. The Lord said his father is incomprehensible and can only be revealed by him the radiance of the father's glory and his word and image. He is a visible image of the invisible God. These are all things that Islam would categorically deny, and yet Jesus affirms these things in the Bible as being about him. Okay, as we see in verse 17, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. We see this consistency with John 5, right, where Jesus has always existed interior to all creation together with the Father and Spirit, and that Jesus just as the, does whatever the Father does. Okay, I do whatever I see the Father doing in John 5. And so if the Father sustains the universe, the Son likewise sustains the universe. Again, this is something that Islam would categorically deny that Jesus, not only that Jesus Christ is God, but even the notion that Jesus Christ could sustain the universe at all, Muslims would say that's a, something becoming and befitting only to God alone. So that's a key thing to pick in mind here, is already when we're reading the New Testament, we're seeing in John and elsewhere in the epistles of Paul and the New Testament that the teachings of Jesus Christ and the formulations of early Christianity are incompatible with Islam. Okay, and we're going to have a second passage to look at is, again, John 14, 21 to 25, another passage from John. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. Right? So Jesus taught that we can only know God truly through him. Likewise, he is incomprehensible and only known by his Father and the Spirit, which shows the united and singular nature of the Godhead. Okay, we also have this problem that we're to love Jesus just as we do God the Father. The same honor and that we render to God the Father, we render to Christ because Father and Son are co-equal. This is again proof for the singular and united nature of the triune Godhead. And so this is again stuff that's going to be incompatible with Islam. Again, we have also teachings from the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 11, 27. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and to the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. So Jesus did not teach the absolute monotheism or tawhid of Islam, which holds that God is strictly one with no partner, and neither does he have a son. This notion of God being Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is denied by the Quran in Islam. For example, see Surah al-Ikhlas, Surah 112 of the Quran. And so what we have here is that the Son knows the Father. The only one that knows the Father is the Son. Okay, we also see that the Spirit searches the deep things of God, and the Spirit knows the Father too. Right? But if the Son knows the Father, in order to know the Father, the Son must be omnipotent. In order to fully know and understand an omnipotent being, the Son must be omnipotent like the Father. 
okay? And that the Son wills to reveal the Father to us by following Jesus Christ the Son, we are following the Father who sent him, okay? Again, again, we see all this proof for Trinitarianism in the New Testament, and it's incompatible with Islam and the message of Muhammad. Finally, just in our short example here, we see that there's penal substitutionary atonement taught by both the Old Testament and New Testament. We have Christ as our mediator, 1 Timothy 2.5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Indeed, Jesus Christ took on human nature in his incarnation and was born of the Virgin Mary, the blessed the Theotokos. And we have seen that the monotheism taught by Jesus is not Islamic in the notion of having father and son and Jesus clearly being God and co-equal to the Father, Islam categorically denies this notion of the Trinity. And we also have the notion of Christ as a mediator in Hebrews 7, 23 to 28, which Islam denies, you pray directly to God, right? And it ignores this penal substitutionary atonement that you find in the Old Testament, such as Exodus 29 or Leviticus 5, where the priests in the Old Testament offered up sacrifices first for their own sins, and then for the sins of Israel, right? In the New Testament, we know that Jesus is the sacrificial lamb who atoned for our sins via the crucifixion and unites us with the Father, making us whole again. We see this in Hebrews 7, 23 to 28. And so that's what we have so far as a starting point in order to show that Christianity is fundamentally incompatible with Islam, okay, we see that the Bible clearly teaches Trinitarianism, and that is the truth, and that is what the Bible teaches, and that is what you would follow. And now we're going to segue into Mark 12, 28 to 37, because in Mark 12, 28 to 34 specifically, we're going to see that this is a passage used by rabbinic Jews, biblical Unitarians, and Muslims to say, hold on, Christians, you guys are misunderstanding the Bible. You're not interpreting it correctly. God is actually one. Jesus is not God. He's not co-equal to the Father. That's just inaccurate church teaching. And they're going to point this passage as reaffirming the Shema of Israel, Deuteronomy 6.4, and confirming strict universal monotheism. And that is just not exactly the case. And so what we have is, I'm going to read Mark 12, 28 to 34. Then one of the scribes came and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth, for there is one God, and there is no other but he, and to love him with all the heart, with the understanding, with your soul, and with all the strength, and to love one neighbor as oneself is more than all the burnt offerings and sacrifice. Now Jesus saw that he answered wisely. He said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God, and this is a key verse to keep in mind. But after that, no one dared to question him. So Unitarians argue the following. All Jews were strict monotheists. Jesus was a Jew. Therefore, Jesus was a strict monotheist. But the first premise is not true, as the Jews did not think that Yahweh was unipersonal in the strict sense, right? Because we have all these theophanies of God in the Old Testament, where God even takes on the form of a man and appears to the Old Testament patriarchs and figures. And now in formulating this argument, Unitarians think to posit that either Jesus was Unitarian or polytheistic. And support of this, Unitarians appeal to Mark 12, 28 to 34, where Jesus affirms the, Israel, the Shema of Israel found in Deuteronomy 6, 4. That's what we see. Hear, Israel, the Lord or God, the Lord is one. This is a quotation of Deuteronomy 6, 4, the Shema of Israel. But in assuming that God is unipersonal, Unitarians assume that he follows the same ontological ordering of created beings. Likewise, they ignore the singular and plural pronouns found in scripture. If God is unipersonal, why does he use personal pronouns when talking by himself? We see this in Isaiah 6, 8 and John 3, 11. So Isaiah 6, 8, also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here I am, say me, send me. And John 3, 11, most assuredly I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen and you do not receive our witness. Isaiah 6, 8, and John 3, 11 show that Yahweh and Jesus Christ use the singular and plural pronouns interchangeably. The we in John 3, 11 refers neither to the Jews nor to the disciples, for they did not witness and see what Christ had seen. 
and now we're going to return to Mark 12, 28 to 34 and examine it in greater detail. The parallel passage in Matthew is Matthew 22, 34 to 40, and it has the scribe ask Jesus to test him, but Mark presents it as an amicable inquiry. That being said, the preceding verses show the Pharisees trying to trap Jesus. So in the previous verses of Mark 12, the re religious leaders try to trap Jesus, which he replies by claiming superiority over all prophets, all men, and all authorities of men. Likewise, he applied that all allegiance is due to him and that men bear his image. So right here, what we're going to see, right, if Jesus is superior to all the prophets, all men, and all authorities of men, he has to be more than a mere human being. Jesus is essentially saying, hey guys, God the Father is God, but I'm the Son of God. I am God too. I am co-equal to the Father. This is what Jesus teaches in all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay, perhaps some people like to say we see this divinity of Jesus Christ most clearly on full display in the Gospel of John, but the truth of the matter is, is that it's in there in all the Gospels, okay? In future videos, we're going to examine the deity of Christ in the first few chapters of Mark, just to show as an example that the deity of Christ can be shown by all four of the Gospels. And even something like the first few chapters of Mark, which is supposed to have low Christology for some biblical critics. And so the question in Mark 12, 28 to 34 is whether Jesus is commanding men to depart from the one true God of Israel. While well, Jesus told them not to worship Jesus, he commanded them to put the same allegiance they show to Yahweh, to himself as the Messiah, right? So he's saying, okay, worship God the Father, but at the same time, he's saying, I am equal to God the Father. He is making himself equal to God the Father as being the, as the Messiah, as the Son of God. And Jesus confirms that he is calling people to worship the one true God of Israel, just as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did. The absolute uniqueness of Yahweh is seen in the passage, Mark 12, 28 to 34, that goes back to the Shema of Israel in Deuteronomy 6, 4. Now, Jesus replies by saying that the scribe is not far from the kingdom of heaven. In other words, if you recognize that it's just God the Father, this strict unipersonal monotheism, you deny the Trinity, okay, you're not exactly at the kingdom of heaven. Okay, the strict unipersonal monotheism is not the correct thinking. It's a trap. It's a temptation from Satan. It's not the way things actually are. We need to recognize that God is triune. And we see this in Mark 12, 35 to 37, what follows. Okay, we follow a teaching on the identity of the Messiah and his relation to Yahweh and David. The scribe thought Jesus was just a descendant of David, but Jesus is much more than that. He is worthy of the same praise and worship as Yahweh, God the Father. So Mark 12, 35 to 37 says, Then Jesus answered and said, Well, he taught in the temple. How is it that the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Spirit, said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore David calls himself Therefore David himself calls him Lord. How is he then his son? And the common people heard him gladly. Okay, so we see that as St. Irenaeus of Lyon says in Against Heresies, the Holy Scriptures and the Holy Spirit have not declared him who is God except him who is truly God and truly Lord by nature, right? Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all words, true God of true God, begotten, not created, one essence with the Father, right? He is co-equal and co-eternal with the Father, and he is eternally co-existed with the Father, yea, even from the beginning, eternal, anterior to all creation. These, uh, this is what St. Irenaeus says of Jesus Christ the Messiah. In response to Psalm 110 and Mark 12, 35 to 37, Irenaeus posits that Jesus Christ has to be more than a mere man, right? If Jesus is just a man, how can he be the Lord of David? Okay, if he's just a mere man, on what grounds is he greater than David? Okay, why is David calling him his Lord? Why is the Lord God the Father saying to my Lord, the Lord of David, sit at my right hand? Okay, why is Christ seated at the right hand of the Father if he's just a mere man? That he's going to conquer all his enemies and make them his footstool. Okay, these are clear implications of divinity. We see this in Wisdom of Sirach 51.10. I called upon the Lord, the Father of my Lord, that he might not forsake me in the days of affliction when I am helpless against the arrogant. I will praise your name continually. I will sing a hymn with thanksgiving. Okay, the Lord, the Father of my Lord, right? This is akin to Psalm 110. 
Okay, we see that Jesus Christ is the Lord of David. He is the Son of the Father, that both Father and Son are truly Lord, as St. Irenaeus, as Justin Martyr, as Melito, as Sardis, as Clement of Rome, as Ignatius of Antioch, as Polycarp, all say the Father is truly Lord, the Son is truly Lord. Okay, we also see in Psalm 110, 3, with you is the beginning, is the beginning and the day of your power and the brightness of your saints. I have begotten you of the, the womb from the womb before the morning star, right? Jesus has existed before creation, before the universe existed. It was Jesus Christ and God the Father and the Holy Spirit existing together as a triune Godhead interior to all creation. Okay, and what we see is that the scribe in this context thought Jesus was just ascended to David, but Jesus is much more than that. He is worthy of the same praise and worship as Yahweh, as we see in John chapter 5, that the same honor rendered to God is to be rendered to Jesus Christ the Son. Now, if Christ is only a creature and a fully human Messiah, why then does he repeatedly demand the same allegiance, obedience, and honor given to Yahweh be given to him? No mere creature can demand such things, yet this is exactly what Jesus Christ does. Yahweh is the one true Lord, but he is not unipersonal, and Jesus is the Lord of David as well. Jesus teaches the authoritative equality of the Holy Trinity as seen in Mark 12. The scribe is right that Yahweh is the only true Lord, but he wrongly assumes him to be unipersonal. For the scribe, the one Lord is God the Father, but for David and all the other prophets, it is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus sought to correct the tribe the scribe and other religious leaders. Ultimately, the scribe is close to the kingdom of heaven, but by assuming God to be unipersonal and the Father as being the only true God, he is blinded to the truth of scripture. Rather than a proof text for biblical Unitarianism, Mark 12, when properly read and understood, supports the Trinity. Right? So we see that Mark 12, 28 to 37 actually supports the Trinitarian, and that's a Trinitarian reading. You can find more info for this in Our God is Triune by Michael R. Burgess, essays in biblical theology, right? So I hope what we've seen so far today is that the Godhead is singular and united, but it is triune. We do not have strict unipersonal monotheism. The truth of God is that he is a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that together these three are worshipped and glorified, together these three have eternally coexisted, interior to all creation, yea, even from the beginning. Okay, as always, thank you for watching. God bless and have a great day.